See you in 2022. So it's late September. The year is 2020, and if you live in America, the summer con season did not exist. We're going into fall and winter. The fall and winter con season also does not exist. I don't think that conventions in America are going to come back in a way where artists can go and attempt to make any sort of money until 2022. And I am not a scientist. I am not a medical professional. But here's my reasoning. Let's say miracle of miracles, we do get a vaccine that is safe and effective by the end of this year. The way things are going with our current administration, there is no plan for distribution. There is no plan for ramping up of production of said vaccine. So. There's going to be a lot of scrambling around. We got it! Yay, Eureka! Let's now make the thing. So we have no idea how it's going to be distributed. We have no idea how it's going to be manufactured, and we have no idea if it's going to be widely available to the rest of us and when that's going to happen. Hopefully, the first people in line to receive the vaccine will be those most affected by it. So first responders and people who are elderly or have pre pre existing conditions. I hope, to fuck's sake, that they get it first because we we are very bad at taking care of each other in this country, and those people fucking deserve it. So, hmm. even if things change in November, there's still a lot of lead time that they have to make up to to get things out to people. So, we'll just try not to get too political or doom and gloom here. Um, But yeah, it's gonna take a while. I think 2021 is gonna be a rebuilding year, a planning year, a execution year of trying to figure out how to get this vaccine out to as many people as possible, as safely as possible, prioritizing those in the most need. That's the best case scenario when the October surprise is: Hey, we got a vaccine. It works. It's safe. Even if we get it in October or November or December. It's gonna take a while, so it's gonna take a while. It's gonna take a while. Never mind the logistics of getting the vaccine out to everybody.、Uh, it's gonna take a while for people to feel comfortable getting in what is essentially a an enclosed box with horrible ventilation, where it is impossible to socially distance from anybody, even at a very small convention, even at a small convention in a small venue. Social distancing. Does not happen at any size convention. Now I don't do the craft fair circuit, so perhaps maybe outdoor craft fairs might become a thing. Maybe they're going to be outdoor comic book conventions where it's easier to to set up away from each other and you know enforce masks and all that kind of stuff. So that business model might emerge in 2021, and for sure,、uh, if if those things do happen, I will be sure to check them out because、uh, I miss. Seeing people, <laughs> and also I would like to make money with my art. But that's why I think 2022 is really the year where we're going to start rebuilding some of this stuff, and that is if we get the vaccine. So whenever we get the vaccine, a year after that, that's when I think conventions are going to happen. So if we get a vaccine in the middle of 2021. Middle of 2022. That's when you'll might you might see some some of the bigger conventions happen, or some of the little conventions happen. I'm not sure what's going to happen first. Like if the first one out the gate is going to be a giant San Diego Comic Con, or if the first one out the gate is going to be your local high school comic convention. I'm just I'm not sure how it's going to play out, but I really think it's going to take at least a year to. To get all this logistic stuff out of the way, that's in America. If you live in another country, I have no idea. I saw footage from South Korea. There was a Gundam show, a Gun Gunpla show, and they had people in there. They had lines all set up. They had you know temperature checks, and everyone was wearing masks inside, and there was social distancing, and it worked.、Uh, so if you're in another country,、uh, your con season might have already started. <laughs> like. And that's great, and I'm jealous, and I want you to invite me to your show, uh, but uh, they're not letting Americans in anywhere. So, 
that probably won't happen. Um, so this is this is a very American focused uh, my concerns <laughs> about life and stuff. Uh, if you are in a country and you know you're doing things better and convention season, you did have a convention season or you're going to have a convention season coming in to the the fall and winter, congratulations. It's got to be great to live in a country where you give a shit about each other. I'm very pleased to hear that. Um, but if you're you're in our situation, uh, you're going to need to make some other plans. Boy, this is getting real depressing real quick. <laughs> All this to say, if you are an artist who is used to making money on the con circuit and this year has fucking sucked for you, you need to start developing other streams of income and most of most of my friends who do run the con circuit already know this in fact most of you watching this probably know this already when you're working for yourself when you're freelance you can't really put all of your eggs in one basket because even during non-crisis times things get dropped contracts get blown clients just fucking ghost you for no reason. So you have to have multiple streams of income. So if something falls by the wayside, you're not stranded. So I have a lot of ideas about this. I am not an expert in any of these. Some of these are things that I'm going to start developing. I'm also working on reopening my store, which has been kind of a pain, uh, but we'll We'll just ignore that for now. So this is kind of like a general survey of ideas to help you get started thinking about developing new streams of revenue. Some of the stuff you might already be doing, maybe there'll be a thing that just kind of sparks your brain and you say, oh my gosh, I never knew you could do that. Um, and if you have other revenue stream ideas for artists and creators, please drop them in the comments. Uh, we're all in this together. We're all looking for ways to to grind it out here. Um, you know, as independent artists, freelancers, we got to lean on each other. We got to help each other out because that's that's how we all grow as a community, as as friends, as co-creators, as co-workers who are socially distancing from each other because we work at home anyway. So we're always socially distanced from our, our coworkers. Uh, I am not claiming to be an expert on any one of these things. So if I miss a lot, uh, that's why. Um, but also uh, a lot of the stuff I'm trying to learn myself. So I kind of figuring it out as I go along. All right, here we go. Number one, you need a mailing list. You need to curate a mailing list. Having good numbers on social media, Instagram or Twitter, it's a good serotonin boost. Makes you feel good about yourself when you post a piece of artwork and people click the like button. That's great. Those are passive followers. All they have to do is push a button. That is the end of their quote unquote active engagement. It's just clicking a heart or clicking a like and then they keep scrolling. It might make you feel good, but those people aren't necessarily going to buy things from you. When a fan types in their email address to join your list, they are making the conscious decision to receive messages from you about your latest releases or your latest projects. And even if you have a tiny, tiny list, these people most likely will buy from you. And this is the part of the conversation that uh, I am not an expert at. I am still trying to figure out what to do with my own personal mailing list. So uh, definitely something I need to research more about. If you are a mailing list expert, please write in <laughs> and, and tell us all about it. But yeah, I, I feel like cultivating a mailing list is even more important than having a large presence on social media. Social media, there's there's no friction to the interaction. It's just kind of a, a fire hose of stuff. Like people who like artists usually like a huge list of artists and then just, you know, click the like button. Hey, that's great. That's great. And they might miss a post where an artist say, hey, I have this new thing coming out. Please purchase it or please check it out and see if you want to buy it from me. Whereas if they're subscribed to your mailing list, they're not going to miss that. Don't spam people on your mailing list. But maybe like a, a weekly reminder or a, at least a, at the very least a monthly reminder of things in your shop, probably monthly to start out with if you don't have a lot of stuff in whatever store you've built. So mailing list tip number one.
Number two, start a patron service or a subscription service of some kind. Get on Patreon. Get on Coffee. Get on OnlyFans. I, I actually don't know if there are artists doing lewd art on Only OnlyFans, but I'm sure there's some sort of subscription model for lewd art out there. Uh, there's got to be a market for that. Like, I don't know. Does Pornhub have like artists drawing stuff? And I don't know. But but whatever it is, set up one of these subscription services. Even if you get like two or three subscribers, even if you if you have a, a low number of subscribers or patrons to begin with, that's something you can build on. And if you're giving good rewards, if you're hanging out with your patrons, if you're talking to them constantly, you can build on that. I have a Patreon. These are all my lovely patrons. So you can build a, a, a somewhat steady source of income through Patreon, even if you're a small indie creator. There's nothing stopping you from getting on one of these services. Just get try to set something up. Someone out there will love your work, whatever it is, and they will want to know how you create it. And that's what Patreon is great for. That's what coffee is great for. That's what all these subscription services are great for. If you can give somebody a value add to your work, some insight on how you create the thing, you know, that's, that's lovely. That's great. And you can, you can build a solid base from that. It's, it's going to start small. It's going to be difficult to start off with. And it definitely helps if you already have a fan base somewhere else. But if you don't have a Patreon or a coffee now, Set that shit up as soon as you log off of this video. Number three, print on demand. The margins suck on print on demand, but you don't have to put your best work up there to generate sales. There is print on demand YouTube, and <laughs> I've just started peeking into it and seeing what's going on. And very few of them are actually artists. A lot of them are just straight up business people going in and saying like, you know, these are the, the things that you can do to, to maximize your tags and all this kind of stuff. And like, this is how you can upload 800 designs to a thing. And I'm like, Oh, Jesus Christ. And what they're uploading is a lot of text stuff. So if you're an artist and you can design nice text, you have a leg up on these guys as, as long as you can figure out their secrets. So, uh, if you're, if you're interested in going the print on demand route, put stuff up that doesn't take you a lot of brain energy or a lot of time. Maybe if you do warm up sketches before you do your actual work, maybe, you know, take a couple of sketches, maybe refine them a little bit and put them up on these print on demand sites. This is not an endorsement of Redbubble per se, but the interesting thing about Redbubble is that if you have an account there and you're just looking through stuff and you click on a thing and then you go somewhere else, uh, you will get an email from Redbubble that says, hey, you forgot to put this thing in your cart. So if you have work on Redbubble and people come across it and they click on the thing, um, they're going to get a message later that said, hey, you clicked on so-and-so's thing. Why didn't you buy it, you jerk? Uh, so that's that's an interesting, that's a great integration and that's a, a great way to get people to actually put the thing in the cart. So print on demand exists. Uh, if you don't have a print on demand shop right now, do it. Put some shit up there. It could be old stuff. It could be stuff that you're not so worried about. Don't be precious about whatever you put on Redbubble. See what works or or on any of these print on demand places. Just just put stuff up there. Uh, <laughs> apparently, quality doesn't really matter because a lot of these uh, people on um, passive income YouTube or print on demand YouTube uh, are not putting up their best work. So you can fudge it too. And I'm sure you can be more successful than someone who just does like impact lettering on a black shirt. You, you're an artist. You can finesse that. You can at least make the kerning a little bit different or like hand draw the letters and make it look pretty sweet. Hand drawn lettering is in and people love that shit on shirts. So print on demand, print on demand, print on demand. The margins suck, but it's usually free to set up. So throw some shit out there. Number four, stock graphics and templates. If you're a designer, this happens a lot in the design world. Sometimes you'll have to create small little icons to represent various things that you're trying to explain in a visual manner. Or maybe you have 
funky templates that you've used to help optimize your workflow. If you've created emojis or custom emotes, that sort of thing, small little pieces of repeatable visual graphic things that you use in an interface or whatever, you can sell that shit. If you've created templates in Photoshop for things like book covers, like maybe you have a book coming out, but you don't have it printed yet. So you want to show off what it might look like in a cover. Some people make their own templates. You can sell that shit. If you do motion graphics and After Effects, a lot of people make their own templates to optimize certain things like lower third graphics or logo animations or whatever. You can sell that shit. Anything that you've created that's templatable or repeatable graphic wise, all of that stuff can be sold on the stock graphic stock template sites. Number five, develop an online course. You have expertise in something. And if you are able to communicate the way in which you create a thing, you can develop an online course like through Udemy or Skillshare or some other site where you can create tutorials or long form learning. Your first course might suck, but it'll get you in the habit of developing these learning products, these e-learning products. And they're very powerful. People ain't got shit to do now. So a lot of people are going to Skillshare and Udemy to learn a new trade. And if you know something that you think you can communicate in a way that is understandable by the general public, develop an online course. At some point, I am going to create my comic coloring course for Udemy. Uh, that was one of my goals for 2020. And then shit happened and didn't have the time. So uh, <laughs> maybe when I finish book two, I can dig into some of that stuff. But yeah, develop an online course, um, especially now that e-learning is so important to basically everybody. People are going to be learning on the computer like second nature. And the nice thing about a, a good structured course is that it's evergreen. So you build it once, you set it, and you forget it. And you can earn recurring revenue off of that. Maybe update it if things change to your process in a couple of years, or if you have a whole new process, maybe part two of your course. So um, there are a lot of resources out there on developing the, the perfect course. And a lot of these sites have tutorials and suggestions on how to build these courses. The other nice thing about developing a course for your specific vocation is that you build expertise in that area. So let's say you're really good at ballpoint pen rendering. If you develop a really good course on ballpoint pen rendering for Udemy or Skillshare, you start to build expertise in ballpoint pen rendering and you become an expert voice in that subgenre of illustration so that when people are looking for that sort of thing, your name might be among a short list of people who do really good ballpoint pen rendering because you've had this course. And anytime you put a course up somewhere, you get a little bit of that prestige, like I know a thing and I can teach that thing. Speaking of building expertise in a field, we come to number six, final thing on this list start a YouTube or Twitch channel. Now you're not going to be able to monetize your channels early on, like I'm still not monetized here. Um, but that's not the point. The point is to become a voice in the community, to build expertise in the community, to build social proof in the community that you know what you're talking about, that you can actually draw the thing, that you can demonstrate some sort of prof proficiency in the thing that you want to be known for. So maybe on Twitch, you have like weekly drawing sessions where you can show off your style or maybe get suggestions from your viewers on things and draw it in your style. Or, you know, you could tell, I don't know shit about Twitch, but <laughs> just show off that you can do the thing that you want to be known for. With YouTube, you can upload tutorials or tips and tricks on various things like drawing and painting or whatever it is you're really good at. And you can do reviews of tools that you use in your daily workflow or upcoming things that are coming out that might be useful. But putting stuff out there on Twitch, putting stuff out there on YouTube, you become a voice in that community. You build social proof in that community so that when people think of, I really like this style or I really like this type of artwork, aha, I know someone who does that. Who does that. I know someone who does that on YouTube, on Twitch. I'm gonna go to them. I might commission a thing from them. So it might not necessarily be monetized at the beginning, but 
when you're building social proof, when you're building expertise in your field, when you're building a reputation around a thing that you can do that no one else can do quite as well as you can do, like a style or a type of painting or like a technique, you become the go-to person for that thing. So there you go. So those are my six ideas for coming up with new revenue streams. Some of these I need to look into myself, like building an online course. I really want to do that. I don't have the time right now, but I really want to do that. And some of this other stuff, I feel like uh, you can just jump in with both feet, like the print on demand stuff, just kind of shit out some stuff. It doesn't have to be your best and don't be precious with it, but it's it's easy to set up. It's easy to try out. And I don't think you have to be exclusive on one platform. So like you could do Redbubble, you could do Threadless, you could do Society6 and you could just kind of see which one works for you and whichever one is making more for you, focus more energy on that one. So, you know, I don't know. You could probably crank out a couple of great designs in an hour or two a day or a week and then upload them and put them on like phone cases and pillowcases and all that kind of stuff. So uh, if you have other ideas for revenue streams for artists, please let me know. Link them up down below, share them in the comments. I'm always curious to see what other people are doing. That's also part of the reason why I lament the the loss of the convention season because it gives you a chance to see what your fellow creators are doing like um the the last convention i went to i saw a few people doing metal prints so getting their artwork done on little sheets of aluminum and stuff like that i know a lot of photographers are are going to metal prints because they're very vibrant and they're easy to hang and they last a long time. And I started seeing some of that in the artist alleys and stuff. So that I started doing some research into it. And I, I think it might be something that I might try to offer when I relaunch my shop. But yeah, like checking out and seeing what other people are doing, that's always a lot of fun. So if you are doing something cool, if you have like a, a sticker place that does crazy hologram foil or whatever uh just link some stuff up in the comments share them with everybody um because that's the only way we're gonna make it out of this <laughs> is if uh we help each other so that's all i got um i showed my patrons earlier here they are again these are people who have come out to support me there are a handful of artists that i'm a patron of uh it's sort of like we're, we're passing dollars back and forth between between us and stuff but i'm always curious to see what other people are working on and there's like a small community that you can start building of other artists. So if you have mutuals on Patreon, it can be a lot of fun. You can kind of like sneak a look at what they're doing and kind of steal some of their ideas and stuff like that. So um, yeah, but uh, if you want to support my stuff, if you want to see some of the things I'm working on, like uh, upcoming books or uh, some upcoming music that I've got, because that's a thing now, uh, you can check out my Patreon and, uh, you know, take take care of each other out there. That's all we got. That's all we got. All right. Bye.